So, quick recap. Um, amongst all the uh, filaments that Luke Taylor from Bollymaker sent me, uh, very kindly, thanks again, Luke, um, were a, a number of them are quite hygroscopic. Um, and so I haven't been using them because I um, don't want to run the risk of them getting too wet. Now because my machine takes um, six rolls of filament, it's got a six input hot end, um, I'm not very disciplined at taking filament off the machine when I finish the print. So it tends to stay there for um, forever. Um, but I also use the space at the side of the printer to store my filament. It, because it's a big machine and it's capable of doing big prints, the prints themselves can take you know, a couple of days or something even. So it seemed the logical thing to me to do, because the printer now sits inside a, a booth which is pretty much sealed um, with acrylic doors on the front which have got seals around as well. Then it seemed like the logical thing to do would be to control the humidity within the entire booth. So that would keep the filament dry when it's in use and when it's not in use as well, uh, when it's being stored. So the booth itself works quite well. It's not actually heated as such, but being sealed um, with the heat from the bed, which is a big lump of aluminium, 400mm by 400mm by 12mm thick. Um, I've been running that at sort of 80 or 90 degrees C, printing ABS and ASA and the temperature inside the booth gets up to a sort of low 40s, that sort of order, after a few hours. So um, uh, I've been printing ABS and, and ASA um, quite successfully um, without the booth being heated as such, um, just the latent heat from the bed. Um, with no draft or anything, so I've not been at it, it's, it's not been warping or trying to um, leave the bed or anything like that, um, trying to curl up, I should say. So that's all fine and dandy, um, but as I say, I, I wanted to um, reduce the humidity, get it as low as I possibly can inside that booth, um, and as cheaply as possible. Hmm. So before I can um, control it, I, the humidity that is, before I can control it, I need to measure it. So um, first thing to do was was to build a, uh, a sensor. So it, initially I looked at those uh, DHT22 temperature and humidity sensors. I've got a few scattered around the house anyway. Um, and I, I bought a pack of five off of Amazon or somewhere for not much money. Um, and just out of interest, I plugged them all into a prototype board and hooked them up to a, an ESP32 uh, module um, just to see how they reacted. Now it's supposed to be plus or minus 5% intolerance um, but I was seeing difference in, in RH of like 15% uh, RH between the lowest sensor and the highest sensor. Um, so 15% RH spread, which didn't seem very good. Which one do I use? Uh, which one's the outlier? Is it the lowest one or the highest one? Um, and I did think about taking an average of all four sensors and using that. But it gets that then gets complicated with the wiring and, and everything else. And even so, have I got a, you know, is it really um, a true RH value? Um, and RH itself isn't, it's relative humidity, which is kind of relative to air temperature somewhat. Um, as the air temperature goes up, the humidity go, the relative humidity will go down. It's just the way it works. 100% relative humidity doesn't mean 100% water in the air. Um, that's the point where it won't hold any more moisture. So that varies with temperature. So I'm more interested in absolute humidity, but you can't actually get an absolute humidity sensor, you have to calculate it. Anyway, long story short, I um, I ditched the DHT22 sensors and bought a BME 280, which is supposedly a bit more accurate. And it also gives pressure, which um, I'm not particularly interested in, but um, it does have a use, which I'll come to later. So basically, I, yeah, I, built a sensor so it's um, 
an ESP32 module and I can hook that into a home assistant which is quite good because then that will give me some graphs um, I can plot long term statistics and see exactly what's happening for humidity control I'm going to need to switch something on and off so I hope to relay up to the ESP board as well um, and I'll get back to this in a minute but currently it's just switching a couple of fans on um, but I can use that for other things. So once I put something together on a breadboard, um, got it all tested and working and so forth, then I um, built something a bit more permanent and um, printed a case for it. Um, it's also got a, an LCD display, um, which will uh, show me the readings that are coming off in, so I can just see at a glance um, what's happening inside the booth but also the information is being sent to Home Assistant and being logged so I've got some uh, longer term statistics I can look at there I can look at it on my computer or on my phone or or whatever as well as just walking in the garage and looking at the screen anyway so then I printed a case here are some, here are some pictures of, uh, of the assembly So in terms of sensors, uh, the BME280 will give me uh, temperature, relative humidity and uh, pressure. I made some custom sensors as well. I wanted to see the minimum and the maximum. Um, and in ESP Home, you can do that um, using what they call templates. So basically I've got template sensors for minimum and maximum temperature and humidity. So the way that works is it just looks at the current reading and then compares that with uh, the minimum and if it's lower than the minimum then it will set the minimum to be that reading otherwise it will leave it alone so basically it's from whenever the uh, module is powered up it will start to log the minimum and maximum readings and it will continue to do that until the thing is powered off again so the LCD display shows those as well so I've got the current temperature and relative humidity and I've got the uh, the minimum and maximum temperature and humidity so that's always on the dis on the LCD display um, I put a little button on it um, on the box as well so I can toggle the um, the backlight on and off and those um, minimum and maximum as well as the current are, are being sent to home assistant so I can log that as well. So I'll cut now to a video I made earlier which explains what I'm doing on Home Assistant. So this is how I have it set up on um, Home Assistant. Um, so I've created a new uh, view tab so uh, that's called Printer Booth um, and then the first panel here is all those sensors that are on the LCD um, effectively with one exception. Um, so we've got the minimum temperature, uh, sorry, the booth temperature that's been reported by the ESP32 from the BME280. Uh, the minimum and the maximum temperatures which are calculated by those lambdas. And the relative humidity and the minimum RH and the maximum RH. Um, and then I've also added just a few minutes ago um, absolute humidity um, which is calculated from the relative humidity it makes a bit more sense it's uh, units of grams per cubic meter whereas relative humidity is um, it depends it's, it's it varies with temperature um, so as temperature goes up relative humidity will go down 100% uh, relative humidity just means you'll get precipitation so it doesn't kind of mean very much I want to know how much water is actually in the air not um, relative um, so absolute humidity if it's being calculated properly I just like scraped the formula from from home assistant where someone had um, done a formula for calculating absolute humidity from relative so it uh, it could be wrong 
um, it looks probably a right sort of value um, but it's in grams per cubic meter and I know that my printer booth is about a meter by meter by two meters so that's um, about two cubic meters so I know that the, well, if that's right then I've got around about um, 13 14 grams of water in the air in the booth Anyway, what's probably more important that, and, and a good thing that Home Assistant is good is the new statistics graphs. So basically I've set three for each sensor. Um, oh, sorry, two for each sensor. So we've got 24 hour RH. Now this is actually not quite 24 hours because this is where I uh, switch the device on and close the doors on the booth. Um, so it's that point there, so we haven't yet got 24 hours of data. And this point here, um, there's a slight rise and then a drop. I basically opened the um, printer booth, turned the printer on and then closed the doors again. Um, and then I started heating the bed, which is a great lump of aluminium, 400mm by 400mm by 12mm thick with the insulation underneath. So we can see the effect that, that actually heats the whole booth up. So first thing this morning, it was at um, you can see here down here 20.5 degrees. This is this is this is real temperature overnight since mm, around about 1800 hours, six six o'clock in the evening. Um, and that's the overnight temperature. And then you can see how the temperature is going up because of the um, the fact that the heat is now on uh, and as temperature goes up humidity goes down that's why I'm not terribly excited about using relative humidity because if we go down here and look at absolute humidity um, it should I would have thought stayed the same because the water content in the air would be the same regardless of temperature and it's going up although that's a very fine scale um, so I'm not sure I need to do a bit of research and see if that's valid it could be there's something wrong with the formula that's calculating this I would have thought it would have been flat lined um, or going down if the humidif dehumidifiers are doing what they should do uh, anyway, so that's that's where we are at the moment. It's a very fine scale, but yeah, it's it's um, why is the water content going up when the temperature increases? It shouldn't unless it's not being compensated properly. Interesting. Anyway, we've got the um, 24 hours down there, RH temperature and absolute humidity, and 30 days RH temperature and absolute humidity so what's going on here you'll notice these have got bands either side uh, well these haven't so basically this is the mean um, this this thick blue line um, because the sensors themselves up update once a minute that's when the BME um, fires up takes its reading and so forth the reason for having once a minute is that it will self heat if you do it too quickly uh, once a minute is fine um, but this graph is an update of every five minutes um, so it's taking the mean value over five readings and if there was significant variation of values it would print the minimum and maximum either side of this um, which is why when we look at 30 days uh, you can see a bit of a band because this one is um, updating every five minutes over a 24 hour period so as these uh, as time goes on and it's been running properly for 24 hours these older values will drop off the end and newer values will appear over here this one is 30 days um, but it's updating once an hour, hour so in an hour we've got 60 readings because the sensor is updated once every minute so hence the mean is the average of those 60 readings for a one hour period um, but it will also plot the minimum and maximum of those 60 readings so therefore you get you should see the band 
uh, the minimum and maximum that it was. Um, same with temperature. This this date is junk at the moment. Um, basically, this is from from this point onwards is relevant. From this point backwards, um, the the sensor was just laying around on my study bench and not inside the booth. I was just playing around with it. Um, so it's junk data at the moment, and because it's only three days worth, that's all you see on the graph. As time goes on. Um, after 30 days, then the 1st of June will be over here. In the meantime, it will stay at 28th of May and we'll just keep adding data and this will get more bunch and bunch and bunch. Anyway, that's where we are at the moment. So, you know, before you can control humidity, you need to be able to measure it and um, we'll see what happens and how things go and whether those dehumidifiers with fans blowing air over them actually do any good or not. And now we'll cut back to the video that I'm recording today. And then what you don't see is something I've very recently done, um, is I've created another template sensor, <laughs> um, which gives me absolute humidity in terms of grams per kilogram of dry air rather than grams per cubic meter. Um, and that's just derived from the first template sensor which gives me grams per cubic meter and then that's where the pressure reading comes in because to get to grams per kilogram um, you have to compensate for um, compensate the temperature and the pressure back to standard conditions so the density of the air is something like 1.204 at standard conditions and that's going to vary um, if those conditions are not standard conditions so the only the only reason i did it um, i did that is it's something i'm reasonably familiar with um, from a previous life when i used to be involved in exhaust emission testing and we used to have to compensate the oxide of nitrogen reading for humidity basically um, uh, going off at a tangent here but oxides of nitrogen are formed at high combustion temperatures if the air is moist going into the engine it will have a quenching effect on the peak combustion temperature and will reduce the NOx. So oxides of nitrogen are always compensated for the, hum the absolute humidity that's in the air. Um, and that compensation factor is only valid between 5.5 and 12.2 grams of water per kilogram of dry air. I'm amazed how I remember this stuff from so many years ago. So I know that sort of 5.5 is low. Um, 5.5 grams per kilogram of dry air is, is a low number. So if I can get below that, um, it will be pretty good. You can say roughly that if you've got absolute humidity in terms of grams per cubic meter, then just divide that by 1.2 and it will give you grams per kilogram, roughly. Anyway, in terms of actual humidity control, um, I've started off with something as cheap as I can find. So I've done a lot of research on uh, different types of humi dehumidifiers. There are advantages and disadvantages of all the different ones. A lot of them have a humidistat built in because they're designed to um, give you a comfortable environment. And low humidity isn't comfortable and breathing it all the time isn't necessarily very good for your health. So these things often switch out off at sort of 30% RH or, or even higher. And I want to get below that. So I looked at simple desiccants. The most common one is silica gel, which we all know about. Uh, the advantage of that is it can be regenerated. But there are better ones uh, that are more able to absorb more moisture. Um, and I settled on, uh, for now, I've settled on using calcium chloride which is very common. Um, I can buy it in bulk by the kilogram. The downside is you can't regenerate it, it dissolves in water. So basically it will dissolve um, as it absorbs moisture from the air um, and produce a kind of a brine solution, which you then throw away. Um, so you can't easily regenerate it. But calcium chloride is common and it's cheap as chips to buy. So I just bought a couple of these room dehumidifier type box type things. 
um, and printed a couple of shelves to put them on. But of course the air in the booth is still fairly static. Um, so I wasn't quite sure how well they would work in still air and thought it might be better if they work if I kept blowing the air over the calcium chloride effectively. So I had a couple of 80mm fans kicking around and so I printed a couple of brackets and here's how they look. So they're just blowing air over those uh, boxes which have got uh, calcium chloride inside. So that's currently what I'm using the relay for. I've set it up in Home Assistant so it works locally. Um, so if the RH is below, is above 20, then the relay's on and the fan's blowing. I don't know whether I'll get down to 20 RH. Um, and I might change that to look at absolute humidity in any case because as I've said before, the RH is going to vary with temperature, but in theory, the absolute humidity should stay the same regardless of temperature. So that's where I am at the moment. So um, the fans are running, the um, boxes are full of calcium chloride, um, and the, uh, the little box of tricks is monitoring it and sending the information to Home Assistant. So. In a few days, I'll have some longer term data and I'll be able to see uh, what's happening and how it's working and stuff. Um, I, initially, it doesn't look like it's going to work very quickly. So that's something I might have to think about. I might have to do something different, um, but I'm trying to keep the cost down, um, not just the cost of buying something, um, but the running costs as well with energy being what it is so that's where we are at the moment and um i'll uh we'll see in a few days time um just how how low the absolute humidity is or not as the case may be so uh, i'll keep you informed thanks for watching bye